Good morning and welcome to worship at Starmount Church. We are thrilled to see you with us this morning. We would like to in invite you to join us for some pre-service music with hymns 401 and 614. And just as a heads up, we will sing 614 twice.
all to worship here at Star Mount Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that everyone is here today. We also want to welcome anybody who may be worshiping with us online, whether live stream or oh, later in the week over the video. So we are glad that you are with us as well. Uh, if you are visiting with us today, we want to extend you a special word of welcome, remind you that uh, we have a welcome desk that is in the back of our, our Narthex back there. Uh, Vicki Winters is back there today, and she would be delighted to talk to you and meet you. If you're a first-time visitor, uh, if you would be willing to give us any contact information, you can do that with her. She also would like to give you a gift and answer any questions that you have. If you are worshiping online, you can go to our, you can go to our website, which is starmountprez.org. Uh, we'll commit a few of the announcements to your reading there on the back of the bulletin, uh, prayer requests, updates. Uh, the couple I'll just highlight is Welcome Home Sunday. That's going to be the first Sunday after Labor Day weekend. Uh, we're going to have a, a special service, lots of things going on, maybe a, a little bit of a report from the mission trip. And then afterwards, there's going to be some activities for families and kids and adults and some coffee trucks and games and all kinds of things. So we hope that you will make a special effort to join us on that day. Also want to highlight that uh, tutoring interest meeting. Uh, that is one of the, you're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, program in a celebration later in the service today, or one aspect of that. And so that is a special part of the ministry of this church and it needs uh, some help and support, and so we hope you'll make a special effort to go to that meeting. There's also going to be, you can attend that in person or Zoom link, so we want to make it as easy as possible. So we hope that you'll just attend and hear more about that. Friends, let us join together in our call to worship, either on the slide behind me or printed there in your bulletin. You are a consuming fire, O God. You are our God and our voice. You are our hope the one we have trusted since childhood. Our praise is always about you and you alone. Let us worship God. Our time of confession reminds us that we don't have to be perfect, that we can't be perfect, and that we need God and each other to walk this Christian walk together. So let us confess together using our prayer of confession. You'll find it in your bulletin or on the screen. 
Let us pray. Before God and God's people, we confess that we have sinned clearly, naming the injustice we see and declaring God's vision. We confess our reluctance to receive our calling as God's people, made by God and chosen as witnesses to God's dream of justice and joy. Remind us, God, that you have made us for your service and recharge us with your word. Renew us, God. Grant us courage to live out your way of peace and grace. In our baptisms, we're often told to remember your baptism. And probably for many of us, we can't remember them because we were but little ones. But to remember your baptism doesn't mean to remember the actual day, but to remember that baptism is a sign and seal of God's love and grace. That no matter how small or how old you are, there is always a calling on your life to live as Christ's disciples. So as we remember our baptism this day, I'm gonna invite you to look at your neighbor and tell them you are a beloved child of God. You are a beloved child of God. Friends, we rejoice when parents claim the promises of God for their children, and today we are thrilled to welcome Emily and Kevin Johnson as they present their son Wagner for the sacrament of baptism. I will invite them to come and join me up here at the baptismal fount, and our elders representing the congregation today are the probably just a little bit proud grandparents of Kurt and Joy Cronenfeld, so we'll ask them to come up here as well. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, obeying these words of Christ and confident of the promises that God has given to us, we baptize them whom He has called. 
In baptism, God claims us as his own and puts God's sign and seal of grace upon us to show that we belong to God. So, Kevin and Emily, as you present Wagner for baptism today, we do ask that you reaffirm your own faith in Christ as well. And so we will ask you to do so by answering these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? Trusting in him, bless you. Trusting in him, do you desire Wagner to be baptized? Do you intend for him to grow up in the nurture of the Christian faith and become Christ's disciple? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian life and teach that faith in your family? Would the congregation please stand? Our Lord Jesus has commanded us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, on behalf of the whole church, promise to guide and nurture Wagner by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of the church. If you so promise, will you please say we do. We do. And as the congregation making these promises, we are now going to affirm our faith using our printed responsive affirmation, which is in your bulletin or on the screen. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. after the bat. <laughs> nice intro. Just a little prelude music to get ready, our hearts and minds ready to pray together. So friends, let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that by water you nourish and sustain all things. Out of deep, unordered water you created this world. Through water you redeemed your people. By water and the Spirit, Jesus was baptized by John. In baptismal water, we are buried with Christ in his death, and then we are raised to share in his resurrection. May your spirit move over this water so that it may be a fountain of welcome and rebirth for Wagner. With the help of your Holy Spirit, may he grow up in every way into Christ the Lord, to whom with the Father and the Spirit be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Friends, as the waters of baptism are poured this day, let us remember with thanksgiving and gratitude our own baptism. On behalf of the session, Joy and I are honored, thrilled, beyond measure, to present Wagner Charles Johnson for the sacrament of holy baptism. Wagner Charles Johnson, child of the covenant and gift of God to this family. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Know that you are a child of God. You always have been. You always are. Amen. Wagner, I want to introduce you to some wonderful people. Your church family here at Starmount Presbyterian Church. We walk you out here because I want you to see all these people, all these people who have shown God's love and God's grace to your family, to your parents, to your aunts and uncles, to your grandparents, 
to your great-grandparents. The folks in these pews have shown them what it means to love God, and they have embodied God's love and God's support for them. And in your church community, there will be people just like these who will show you how much God loves you. <laughs> Wagner, you have also given a great gift to this congregation today. In your baptism, you have helped us remember our own baptism, and you have also reminded us of the nature of God's love and of God's grace and of God's forgiveness, that it is not earned, that there is nothing that we can do to earn or deserve it, but it is a gift that is given freely. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Emily and Kevin know that the promises of God are for you and your family. So may God bless you and keep you now and forever. Amen. We wanted our children to remain in the service to see that baptism, but if there are those who now would like to go downstairs with Cindy, she is right over there and would love to go downstairs and spend some more time with our young ones today. So That is a dangerous invitation. Some of the adults might take me up on that as well. <laughs> So for the last several weeks, we have been focusing on this concept, this idea of faith. We have been looking at the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews, we get this wonderful, succinct kind of definition for faith, which is that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We've been sort of exploring that, deconstructing that definition a little bit. But this week, I went to a different source to find a little bit of a different definition of faith. Several of you may have seen this in the news. A uh, kind of prolific uh, author, theologian, uh, Presbyterian minister died this week by the name of Frederick Buechner. Uh, you may have read his books. Uh, you may have certainly heard his comments on different kinds of things. Uh, again, prolific author, theologian, has uh, helped shape the faith for many a, uh, many a seeker. And so I went to, to this book called Wishful Thinking. It is it's called A Seeker's Guide ABC. So it's literally written like a dictionary for seekers, for folks maybe curious about the, faith, about the faith. And so I went to see what the faith entry in this book says. And of course, it's a couple of pages. I won't read the whole thing to you. But this particular uh, section I found very enlightening. This is what Frederick Buechner has to say about faith. Faith is better understood as a verb than as a noun, a process than as a possession. It is a on again, off again, rather than a once and for all. Faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. Faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. As he always did, Buechner is able to kind of boil down complex theological concepts into some pretty plain language. He summarizes everything we've been studying over the last couple of weeks, looking at the book of Hebrews. Faith is this practice that is brought to life in our actions, in what we do and say and think. It is not merely some intellectual pursuit, something that sits on a shelf or an object that is encased behind stained glass. 
And our scripture for today provides us a little bit of an example of this. So we're going to move from reading an epistle that talks about faith and instead today read something from the Gospel of Luke that gives us an example of this faith that is put into action and it highlights the courage that faith requires. And so friends, as we read this scripture today, I I hope you'll keep what Beekner said in mind. Faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. Friends, let us hear the word of God. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up, and when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I love a good heist movie. Do you have any, any good heist movie recommendations? A good heist movie where there are sort of thieves that get together and they maybe have a hideout and they plan some kind of thing they're going to go steal. They're going to execute some kind of heist. If I find a movie like that, I am happy to watch it over and over and over again. You can just ask my wife if you need some confirmation on that. Now, I'm not talking about a, a robbery movie, right? There are those movies where, where the people come in with sort of guns and they try to steal something just by sheer force. Not, not those kinds of movies. Those are still good, but not the kind I'm talking about today. A good heist movie. Think kind of an Ocean's Eleven type vibe if you've seen those movies. One where clever thieves, they dream up some elaborate plan to steal money or jewelry or artwork. And in these movies, these thieves are usually up against an equally clever group of maybe police or some kind of security personnel or an owner or curator that is working hard trying to stop them. And so in these movies, these two forces sort of oppose each other. They go back and forth in some kind of cat and mouse type game. One trying to take an asset, the other trying to keep it locked up and secure. In our scripture, we've got this similar scenario playing out. These two forces that are working against each other. One, not so much trying to steal, but but trying to set free, to liberate, to restore. And the other trying to control, to limit, to secure. On the one hand, we've got Jesus and this woman that he heals. And on the other, we've got this leader of the synagogue that condemns that healing. And so we're going to begin by looking at the healing itself, this encounter between Jesus and this woman. Now, normally in stories, miracle healing miracles like this, it involves the, the person wanting to be healed to, to call out to, to Jesus or to seek Jesus out in some way. Or maybe even have advocates, friends that will seek Jesus out, asked to be healed. But that's not what happens in today's scripture. The woman doesn't approach Jesus. The woman doesn't ask for healing at all. The woman probably is just doing the same thing that she normally does, going to synagogue on the Sabbath faithfully. We can assume that because of her condition, this woman probably worked pretty hard not to draw attention to herself. Her physical appearance would have certainly made her stand out. So she was bent all the way over and could not straighten herself up. So that's how she would have walked and sat and lived day after day. And so certainly would have made it very difficult to to walk or to see where she was going. But I don't think she had any problem with hearing. 
I'm fairly certain that she probably could hear when those people whispered, those people commented on her appearance whenever she walked by. Now, even though our scripture says this woman appeared in the synagogue, probably what it means is she just simply entered into the space. Maybe she slipped in late after the service had already begun to take a seat somewhere on the back row, hoping not to be noticed, hoping to sort of avoid those awkward encounters with others as they gathered for the service. Perhaps this is her habit. Perhaps this was her habit for two long years decades now. Perhaps she had simply resigned herself to the suffering brought about by her social condition just as much as she was resigned to her physical suffering. Jesus sees this woman who worked so hard to go unnoticed and he calls her up, calls her out. Now perhaps he walks over to her or she walks over to him or maybe they meet in the middle somewhere but either way I don't don't want to brush Past this pivotal moment in the scripture, because this is the moment that illustrates for us the courage of faith. Frederick Beekman reminds us that faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. And so when Jesus calls out this woman, I would imagine that every instinct in her body was telling her to run away, to run and hide. She, she just as easily could have gotten up and left the synagogue or just turned her face and ignored his call, embarrassed, afraid, this woman who had conditioned herself to blend in for two decades, but she chooses a different path. She goes to Jesus when he calls Indeed, perhaps maybe the author of the book of Hebrews that we were reading for the last couple weeks should add her to that list of Hall of Fame faith heroes because it is by faith that she gets up and walks. She fights through the pain both physically and socially, and she meets Jesus. Now, unlike a heist movie, Jesus doesn't steal anything from the woman. Rather, he gives her something. He sets her free from her burdens. Jesus bends down himself, maybe, meets her eye to eye, places his hand on her bent over back, and he heals her. Now, in a heist movie, when something goes missing, when it's discovered that the the money or the jewelry or the artwork is not where it should be, then the authorities all sound the alarm and they lock the place down. They put it in lockdown. And this is what happens in the scripture. This is what the leader of the synagogue does when he sees what happens between Jesus and this woman. When Jesus frees, the leader of the synagogue freaks out. He is afraid that things might start to get out of hand, and so he's got to put a stop to this. He immediately jumps up, sounds the alarm. Scripture says he is indignant in his response. I can imagine him opening the Torah or the book, firmly pointing to where the rules for the Sabbath are and making sure everybody knows the page number so that he can remind those who are there the limits of what is appropriate, what should or should not be allowed. Don't get any ideas out there, folks. It clearly says, no healing on the Sabbath. If faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway, then the response of this leader makes it clear that he has no intention of going wherever it is that Jesus might be headed. Now, the response of the synagogue leader in our scripture reminded me of of an old youth group story where some church leaders come in on a Monday morning and they discover a fresh Kool-Aid stain on the carpet. Probably a white carpet too, right? And some red Kool-Aid, that would make it stand out really well. Some red Kool-Aid on a white carpet. They march down to the youth leader's office to confront him about it, perhaps maybe with that same kind of indignant tone that was found in our scripture. And they look him straight in the eye and they tell him, they say, there is a Kool-Aid stain on the carpet. And they are taken a bit aback at his response. He smiles, he looks excited, he says, I know, isn't it great? You're welcome. They are a little taken aback, they're a little offended at what the youth leader had to say. But he continues, he says, we had so many youth here last night, we couldn't fit into our normal space. We were spilling out all over the place. Isn't that fantastic? 
You see, when the church leaders and the youth leaders saw that red Kool-Aid stain on the carpet, they saw two different things. For the church leaders, that stain represented a rule that had been broken, time and money that would have to be spent to correct it, maybe some signs that would need to be purchased and hung so that it would never happen again. However, the youth leader, when he saw that stain, he knew that that meant that youth were in the building. Young folks who have a million other things that they could be doing at that time chose to be in that space, to be learning about Jesus, to be learning about God's love and growing in their faith. For the youth leader, that Kool-Aid stain on the carpet represented a transformed life, a result that was well worth the investment of the time and the money it would take to clean a spot on a carpet. Likewise, in our scripture, when the synagogue leader and Jesus witnessed the healing of this woman, they saw two different things. The leader saw a rule that was being broken, his traditions being trampled on, a threat to the way things had always been done. And so he quickly tried to lock things down. But what Jesus saw, what Jesus saw was a child of God who had already been locked down for far too long. What Jesus saw was a woman suffering in bondage, in need of God's healing, of God's grace, of God's transformation, a transformed life. Like in those heist movies, the, the church leaders, the synagogue leader in both of these stories are characters that make some pretty convenient villains. It's easy to root against the ones who try to keep everything locked down, contained and controlled, tied up tight like the livestock example that Jesus gives in the Scripture. But since our Scripture kind of pivots on the perspective of people who, who see the same thing in radically different ways, we might be wise to, to pause a little bit here, to gain a little bit of perspective, especially before we're too hard on these leaders in our stories. Because sooner or later, we too might find ourselves joining their ranks. For weeks now, we've been focused on faith, and the truth is, that if we attempt to live out our faith in Christ long enough, if we try to follow Jesus close enough, then eventually Jesus is bound to take us to some places where we are less than comfortable, perhaps even some places that we do not want to go. And just like in our story when God calls the, the folks into a direction that they are unsure if they want to go, then our knee-jerk reaction is probably the same as those leaders, to ring alarm bells, to try and lock things down. However, Frederick Bigner reminds us, faith is not being sure where you're going, but going anyway. And so, friends, may God grant us the courage to live out this kind of faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.
A couple of weeks ago, this giant yellow school bus kind of appeared in our narthex, filled with school supplies lists for some of our kids and our teens associated with our tutoring ministry. Your response to this call was outstanding. We received every single item that we needed to send with the kids to school the very next day. Some of our young ones are on that kind of early start schedule, so they went to school Monday morning after Sunday when they received their backpacks and their pencils. I want to press this celebration just a little bit further. I always loved new school supplies as a kid. Maybe you were kind of like that. Loved shopping for them, the newness, the freshness. But these are not just pencils and notebooks. The provision of these is a stressor taken off of parents who work really long, really difficult hours to provide for their family. We save them a trip. We save them over $50 per kid. Yes, that's what school supplies costs. They are confidence boosters to the new sixth grader who's nervous about every single thing except whether they have enough pencils or not. It's an excitement for the new kindergartner who might be scared to start school, but now is very excited about a book bag in her favorite color. These are not just things, but a chipping away at some of the barriers that these kids feel at school. It breaks a distraction they might feel about what they have or what they don't have so that they can focus on their learning and their social building. This has always been one of the main focuses of the tutoring program, helping students do their very best in school so that they will receive the benefits of education and the opportunity it affords them in this country. We are so thankful for your support of this project. The tutoring ministry is in a bit of a rebuilding after COVID impacted everything we could do. We are in serious need of tutors, and you'll hear about that more along the way, but we're in kind of a critical moment where we're assessing whether we have the human power to support this ministry. If it's something you've done in the past, if it's something you've never done in your life, if you have even a small bit of interest, please talk to me because there are so many ways to support this ministry. And I invite you to that meeting that you see on the back of your bulletin to hear more about our plans. But there are many, many ways to support this ministry, and it's one that is very important and one that has lasting impact in our community. So grateful for our gifts, the gifts of God and the gifts we bring, let us pray together we're going to use a responsive prayer for our prayer of the people this morning. I will say, God of mercy, and you will respond with, hear our prayer. So let us pray to our sovereign, saying, God of mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, you invite us to honor and reverence your name through acts of praise and thanksgiving. Hear us as we articulate the concerns of our lives, our community, and the world. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your holy church. Make us humble in our service and generous with our invitations to the outcast. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the needs of the world. Spur leaders to forego the honor and privileges of power and to address the concerns of the poor. God of mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for those in our community who are burdened by suffering, who are sick, who are in need, who have coming procedures, and anyone who seeks a deeper knowledge of you. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the departed. We rejoice that they have returned to the place of their consecration and rejoice in the company of the saints. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and compassion, you honor those in our world who do not seek tribute or respect. Help us to expand our vision that we might release our need for privilege and instead seek the honor of your service. We ask these things through the meditation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, faith is not being sure where you are going, but going anyway. So as we leave this place to take that journey of faith, may we remember that we are not alone on that journey, that we are claimed as God's children, that we are washed in the waters of baptism, that we are covered by God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. Friends, May now God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.